Hello everyone, today we talk about the subjectivization of devotional art during the 14th century, which is interesting because just the other day we were talking about the personalization, subject, subjectivization if you want to, um, of 12th, 13th century religiosity because of the spread of mendicant orders, a new, um, a different way to look at uh, biblical exegesis in a public uh, way um, in vernacular, right? So something that grew close to the people uh, at a at a mass level for those time standards, um, which, as we've seen in that video that today we will not um, expand on further, naturally corresponded to the broader control that the church was assuming with the integration of many kind of orders um, of the you know papyristic evangelical uh, movements and instances and the broader. Um, you know, organize say political, social organization of the Christian community. Um, now, today we talk about history of art fundamentally, and um, also recently we addressed. Um, I think it was the video on Gothic cathedrals, in which we observed fundamentally how by the 13th century um, it, it's really difficult, you know, artistically wise, and you know that as a broader you know, a reflection of other political institutional developments um, to assess a, let's say, an homogeneity, a uniformity, uh, for example, of the Gothic style and all it, it entailed. And we were talking mostly at monarchical or at least high nobility or high um, uh, clerical level. Um, by the 14th century, we see today that process at a dynastic seigneurial level had brought art in that specific field to, mm, let's say, a form of routinization. Mm. This is um, 14th century is a, se a century of crisis. We, we, have s we have seen it many times, made multiple videos on that, you know, that there is a big economical crack, uh, the black death, um, a, a brusque contraction of demographic uh, economical activities. It's a bit the um, collapse, but on itself, right? It didn't crumble, uh, you know, to the ground, like ancient civilization, of the great medieval civilization rising through the 13th, uh, up to the 13th century, and the beginning on this on this base of a, you know, of different approach that naturally stemmed from this break, from this brusque rupture, and that had its own, um, if you want, psychological effects, um, uh, mass level on on art as well. Um, so there were different responses. So. Why did we mention dy uh, dynastic and seigneurial art? Well, because in there, you see in this period, um, from one side, uh, a crisis of values, right? F think about France, that the 13th century had dominated as the largest power there. Now it gets engulfed in the Hundred Years' War, important trade routes across the counter cut off, and they're, you know, shifted elsewhere. Um, it it's at that point, specifically, that the French monarchy needs, as it often happens in history, right? You know, with the, a, a propaganda mean that would emphasize unity, right? Uniformity, in a sense. This was reflected in art, too. Um, this is often the case historically. I mean, when when things are going dramatically well, there is always propaganda. There is always uh, political image, vision, etc. But at the same time, it's, it's in the riskiest moment that um, for for reasons that are interesting to analyze also not just politically but sociologically uh, you need um, more uh, let's say propaganda is a relatively cheap and effective way of investing in times of crisis right because it, the crisis stems exactly from this major structural problem so uh, the growth itself has ended so also the experimentalism attached is is a stop in a way so you have to at that point as we were saying insist on yourself um, falling on yourself and stressing for example what we see in the 14th century is kind of um, properly more than the 13th in a sense or even the 12th when the things began the, the insistence on a concept of national monarchy right of a of um, the creation of a, of a unity that goes beyond the feudal hierarchy and the attempt to subordinate this de facto independent or semi-independent mm, principalities to be part of the wall and now the count emerges ideally right in naturally all in a uh, in a very different way from nationalistic standards of um, half a millennium later but still significantly to confer this homogeneity 
to that dynastic signorial art because there was a standard that was being searched for and imitated and it had to be like that to certify in a sense the legitimacy of the same authority that didn't have much m of an option though in parallel however we uh, at a popular level we have a um, broader crisis because uh, the mid 14th century crisis had struck chiefly the, the lowest strata of the population so these masses of people were many because medieval civilization had boomed demographically speaking in Europe uh, and especially in Europe and and all these masses that had suffered most had therefore more been more paralyzed psychologically had lost more but at the same time had been ever more controlled and framed under the elites control the oligarchies um, they were working for them and and, and this mm, let's say opening uh, the subjective opening of um, of, of art, of devotional art especially, is the one that has the, the most direct contact with faithful, um, also in a private sphere, became, if you want, I don't want to mean that this is the mean of control, but it definitely, you know, helped to, you know, comfort, in a sense, also the, you know, the masses, this broader, um, you know, communities that had been struck by the crisis and needed you know, some uh, somewhat reassuring message in a world that otherwise was going pretty damn bad, at least specifically for, from their own perspective, uh, because for the rest, you know, it was actually acquiring also a stability in that regard. So it's like in the other video, th this is interesting because we are in, in the center of humanism. We are in the century of, you know, state building um, at many levels. And, and, and we see under this, you know, the same control, on the populations, however, an attention directed to the individual, mm -hmm. which is an improvement, right? That's the same reason why medieval civilization didn't die like the ancient one, but it basically evolved. It, it took this shock, it absorbed this terrible hit, and went on with the need to find a human centrality in this, from an individual point of view, in this mess, so that, you know, this also expresses hope, after all, in the capacity of mankind, and that's the humanistic idea. Um, so, the process was, was low, naturally. Um, we, we can see some patterns here and there that also belong to the previous century. For example, um, you know, in the 13th, with the birth of the Gothic style in the figurative arts, um, there was already the emergence of a new naturalistic pictorial rhetoric. Right, um, not just in the imagery, but properly in the um, representation of the object as such, uh, as as an individualized entity. Right, um, in 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 previous times, it it was the universal collective, if you want, aspect that had characterized the devotional practices. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, instead, the metaphysical uh, attention essentially shifted to the uh, the surface appearance of the represented world, that often was, in this sense, uh, something you know, not complexive, uh, but individual. Right? It could be a figure, it could be a simple landscape. It was not this greater universalistic uh, look at the world that would render, if you want, the the individual less significant, um, in spite of all the also humanistic, you know, confidence that surely had emerged already since the 12th century, um, in uh, in the sense that, that that mankind could could was seen now in, in a more positive relation with with a, with a god who was ever more similar, uh, ever more compassionate. Right, early medieval um, uh, Christian art was, you know pretty dark, right, it was, was concerned with the idea of the, the, the punishment of, you know, divine of wrath and so on, of fear of hell, things had improved. In the 14th century, the, the further crack shifts, if you want, I, I don't like psychologistic interpretations of history, but objectively, there is a sort of an inward look now that starts happening, of the individual that needs to confrontate fundamentally with what happens in his sp own specifically life, um, not just what is happening around, because the, the world is becoming a mess, the, the universality is done for, in, in at least in the previous uh, 
uh, by previous standards. I mean, the papas in the empire during the 14th century shrink dramatically. Um, there is the emergence, as we've seen, of these different, um, you know, polities that, however, consolidate themselves as, and therefore mm, pave the road towards a sort of secularization. The idea that there is a, a country there, a kingdom there, not just, you know, the big empire that theoretically was to rule on everybody. Um, this is very important because it favors the subjectivization of art. And this pictorial rhetoric, um, you know, projected uh, afresh the spectator towards um, uh, an intimacy, right, and a religious subject matter that was associated for this reason with, with new teams that were usually more humanly focused. From a, from a, also in terms of single characters, favorite teams were the Virgin Mary, the Passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. So subjects that were ever more individualized in their human experience, not just in a broader celebration that could entail a, a broader, but you know, it's as if the focus had shrank directly on that human figure, the single human figure, that became naturally ever more expressive and capable of transmitting certain, you know, feelings to the observer that is taken um, in, in serious, con serious consideration by art as the one who would derive the most benefit interiorly from um, and not much collectively anymore to say had been in the past uh, from that art um, so the 14th century saw a development of these uh, rhetorics and themes um, but um, let's say it, um, it concentrated also to new types of image that were functional mostly to the uh, devotional practices and as we've seen this broader uh, sentiment um, of the time religious wise that was more interior after all the horrors that think about black death uh, this mass uh, you know, that's, you know, it was something that had shocked popular conscience. Um, and even in here, it's not even particularly useful to stress the popularity of this art, because literally these um, styles appear basically everywhere in, um, in, in late medieval art, right, Level, all levels of patronage. So, mm, yes, as we've seen, dynasties, lords were starting to create their own secular uh, art uh, that was always all, all intertwined with the religious one, but still, you know, taking a different path with different function. These other forms were instead becoming extremely, I mean, popular in the sense that they even surpassed properly the, the commoners, uh, and they began to invest other, you know, any other field of, of in fact, of private art, in a sense. Um, and there was especially a... Um, as we've seen, a connection between the spectator and this new form of art. This is to be seen both in Gothic proper, uh, in Italian art, and the 14th century witnessed um, this great spread of the Andachtsbild, um, the devotional image everywhere, Northern Europe, Italy, so all Western Europe fundamentally, and um, the most favored subjects were the Veronica, the Men of Sorrows, the Pietà, so all very, you know, deep and also kind of painful and, uh, if you want, also upsetting subjects, right? And here it would be interesting to digress on the various t kinds of national art because uh, this was a time in which, for example, the deed of martyrdom was spreading also in some countries. This is the, the century, the first Ottoman advance. Think about countries like, I don't know, Serbia or... Um, so we'll be talking about that, but I mean the concept that the sufferance enters in also in some fields that... In Western Europe may are not so evident, so Western Europe had the largest production, in, in, artistically wise. Um, but uh, let's say that there is um, a model that gets you know, used, you know, declined by also other contexts that sh obviously were influenced by Western art as well. On these themes of, of, of sufferance, of death, of resurrection, um, and they were um, fundamentally aimed at 
provide, like to concentrate a devotional attention upon um, non-narrative uh, iconic representations, right? It was not a matter of telling a story much, a sequence. Uh, this is still this entry of, I don't know, of Giotto, for example, that surely brings on this dramatic humanity. The Italian heart in there is, is very humanistic in that regard. Um, but let's say that the, the most common attention now is concerns the passion of Christ. And it's suited to contemplative immersion. It's an isolated figure. It's an intimate one. The spectator looks into it and there is connection aimed at making the spectator feel within. Mm -hmm. And th this form of the devotional art naturally had a, an impact also on non-religious art at the same time. It may be not coincidence, for example, that um, the same 14th century there was the spread of small-scale portraits painted on panel, usually in profile, um, uh, with secular, you know, subjects uh, such as, for example, it's very famous the one of John II of France uh, at the Louvre uh, from the mid 14th century. Uh, also, other small devotional panel paintings that are very compressed or almost claustrophobic in form, so that do not leave margin for for distraction from the the actual figure. Uh, figure that fundamentally. Uh, transmits this face-to-face -face experience with the with the divinity or as we've seen with these other figures as well such as the king of France and that um, created if you want a mystical bond between the spectator and, and, and the figure. That is important also for what we were saying before about the strengthening of a, a national unity of you know a loyalty to the crown uh, the example uh, from uh, from John II is, is eloquent in that regard. Before uh, these things would wouldn't exist, right? It's probably more iconic. Also making a comparison with uh, with Orthodox art, right? There are, there are some there are some interesting parallelisms. Now, these contemplative images went in parallel with other mm, devotional practices that were lay and religious alike, um, such as, for example, the devotio. Uh, modern, right? Um, devotional manuscripts such as the books of hours, also other forms of paintings um, that um, fundamentally focus much more on the mm, confessional and penitential side um, for for the reader, for the observer, for the spectator. Then it had been in the past, right? So it's something that talks directly to the individual and establishes a contact that it is also to be you know, perpetuated over time. Um, this is to be found all over Western Europe, right? At this point, um, uh, Europe is really, by the 14th century, the, the great difference, I mean, it could be from, you know, mm, early medieval particularism sees, right? Western Europe is fundamentally all alike in many ways, um, and such um, devotional experiences and exercises uh, of lay people become really, really similar all over the region. And mm, contributing to this uh, had been the, the spread of religious orders, their increased um, organization, uh, uniformity, uh, you know, the capacity of spreading a common message, common forms, um, representative forms. Um, we were saying, in fact, the other day about ver vernacular preaching that was, in fact, mm, often based also on these, um, let's say, more familiar, you know, you went in parallel also with certain visual images, not just the, the preaching ones, but it would be more similar to follow also from, from the rest of the people. Not just because it was in vernacular, but because also they were uh, s some excerpts, some, um, you know, just cuts, if you want, from, I don't know, biblical stories, uh, that naturally focused on the individual uh, and were to be followed most like a narrative, right? So it became more intimate than before. And from more humble people, if you want, such as the, the, the mendicant orders. There was also a very important change um, triggered by the introduction of the doctrine of purgatory, uh, 
that had been formally promulgated at the Council of Lyon in 1274. Why? Well, because of course purgatory introduced the, mm, the instruments and the, let's say, uh, the, the possibility of conceiving uh, a more mm, subjective effort in order to save essentially the soul um, of the you know your own as well as one of your uh, of the deceased of the of the of the past uh, and that therefore tied um, even more the the individual to this mm, self commitment if, if you want dimension in which the individuality not much the collectivity if not you know more in a familiar context etc praying for the 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 seed etc um, and uh, this is quite important because it naturally gives revel relevance to to the individual and it shifts also um, the the artistic attention towards for example I don't know funerary art art that at this point is ever more elaborated uh, because naturally that was part of the you know the purgatorial indulgence in, in a sense um, yeah. as well that took on naturally also a mm, uh, you know, collective meaning. For example, it, it's obvious that just very elaborated funerary monuments are were, were part of the elite. So the elite, I presume, in this sense, had to show because the, there were teams such as vanitas and humilitas that were being reproposed. Why? Because um, wealth difference increased, the wealth gap increased between the the classes. So, in a sense, also the elites had to demonstrate to be more, uh, you know, uh, more worthy. Of their place, it was not much. Uh, there was not much of a struggle between classes anymore. Now the oligarchy was at the top, and it had to present itself, though legitimate, also in this kind of individual, um, you know, prowess, worthiness, mm, religious-wise. Um, reasons for which, as we will see later, especially for funerary monuments, there are particular, uh, new particular themes, forms, etc. So funerary chapels or chantries were developing rapidly, um, while in the field of uh, images there, there was um, a greater uh, individualistic and subjective character of the of the judgment at death, right, and cleansing, uh, cleansing thereafter, that was implicit to the doctrine of purgatory. Um, that if you want to cut um, at a certain level with the formal and collective eschatology um, that had characterized earlier uh, you know the vo you know the earlier art right in that universal sense I mean the last judgment is you know probably the, the most ecumenic a definitive a collective thing you you can you can see well that that tends to disappear to shrink and it's just it's individual that comes more on the floor um, isolated, if you want, from others. So that salvation became, if you want, even a more private matter at that point. It's something in which individuals had somewhat more control. Uh, it, it's difficult also to make a specific comparison with the pre with previous times, because naturally we have also less um, do documentation. Uh, we know people reason differently. Right here, in a sense, much of what we think of the Middle Ages w was being formed right towards the end of it, right in the most standardized kind of uh, orthodox um, f formalized f uh, structures, and um, therefore before also the the approach to certain issues we we don't know clearly, right, and we can see that also some communities presumably didn't didn't quite conform necessarily with a standard. Um, and you know there were there were still the the, the permanence of survival of certain previous local practices and paganism in a sense. So, but this is let's say another field we will talk about another time. Um, so this naturally brought to uh to the implementation of a somewhat increasingly sophisticated um, set of, of of instruments, right? To to back now that the new logic of purgatorial in indulgence uh, there was something relatively new in, in itself um, so the there were, there were new aspects that were explored too for example I in Italian art the fresco especially fresco painting uh, offered new means of um, pictorial space um, exploration 
um, in, uh, in this sense in a multidimensional fashion, that is to say, conceiving the spectator uh, at the center of a, of a story also sometimes, of something that not, was not necessarily more mm, collective to, to be felt, but let's say a sort of mm, a stripe that would pass and would make the, the individual gaze at it and making uh, arise emotions. They're very dark, loaded, um, you know, uh, strong images um, uh, in many ways. And in Western art for the first time, images um, catered specifically to the consciousness of the individual spectator, right? For the first time, right? It was taken into consideration as individually, right? Um, as if salvation could be, individual salvation could be uh, mirrored in, in by these by these works. There is definitely also a morbid aspect of late medieval religious and funereal art that now assume also more sophisticated means um, <coughs> primarily, for example, a form of Gothic terror that, um, for example, in Italy is not to be found equally, but even in there you find pretty gruesome, mor morbid stuff about, you know, the emphasis, the stressing of, you know, the corpses, the composition. That That is, I mean, think about the dance macabre, the, the triumph of of um of 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 that all, all these things, I mean that were triggered naturally by, you know the the fourteenth century black death, um, but now they were being expressed also with more you know if you want with more detail even anat anatomically speaking naturalistically speaking, and you you can sense their the obsession with 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 death in, in a sort of morbid interest for it, um, because it had evidently become part of a, you know, an everyday reality, because Black Death, by the way, didn't stop just, you know, the, those first years, it came back on cyclically at some point, up to the 18th century, so, um, as we've seen, this coupled with the classes differences, it's, you know, always brought the revival of the idea, oh, look at how, you know, many rich elite people there are there, and we've seen that, that went in parallel with, with a positive path of state building, of the creation of, you know, some order, some hierarchy. Um, so this great richness, individual richness of some at least, uh, and then the misery of that was ever more stressed. This is a, you know, uh, a topic that remained, was very, very common also in early modern art. Um, it, it, re it was there to remain for a long time. It surely expresses much, you know, the, the realistically, also, what was the general feeling and, and rhetorics and attitude and so on? Um, the, mm, for example, uh, the the three living and the three dead, the the tale over the dance of death, um, and the most horrific ones, especially some are very realistic, are the transiton, right? So the the vigil representation of the deceased as a decomposed corpse, right? And uh, this. Mm, does transmit a general sense, as we've seen, of pessimism, of anxiety, but you gotta give it's it's also paralleled by by an effort. It, this is what what remains. Humanism, Renaissance, are born in these in this cultural background, and and that reveals you the the importance of the crisis as a further booster of civilization. And as we've seen, the medieval one made it to to develop on itself and and not to, to, to shrink, to, to disappear. Um, there is definitely in these representations a new form of self-consciousness for the spectator that surely is posed in front of also kind of upsetting, disturbing images that make them realize of, you know, even its own curiosity towards certain things. Um, probably the best, uh, I mean, there are interesting examples of transit homes but perhaps one of the earliest known is very fascinating. That shows already the 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 contrast between the wealth in uh, you know in earthly life and the misery of death is the one of the cardinal uh, Jean de uh, Lagrange in Avignon, at the Cathedral of Avignon, um, that presents the cardinal well dressed, etc., in life and so on, and below the corpse, naked decomposed and so on and this naturally is a uh, is a monument to vanitas and humilitas and therefore 
this uh, memento mori that is was a team always present in 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 medieval Christian consciousness, but that this this century contributed to to boost further for 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 different reasons as we've seen they are not just monofactual but they definitely have to do with a greater crisis and the the, the, the lack of certainty even in certain aspects um, and let's not underestimate in this regard the let's say the the, the concept of orbis senesh it's that it, especially for for a medieval average medieval person in Europe Western Europe would have been well uh, exemplified by the decline of the papas in the empire I mean something that was supposed to be there as the, the two major authorities in the world now they shrink dramatically so w what's out there right the, the, it was the only possible uh, picture idea so even this insistence on death on this um, um, it's uh, I wouldn't say just you know it, it's obviously not a desecration but it's really also the, the eye of a proto-modern um, man that looks at death also in a in a in a colder more disenchanted way right this is naturally meant to transmit that sense of anxiety and remembering usefully what that is about but at the same time it's it's a way of saying you know we're able to represent that we know what it is we're not kind of scared of it much anymore and this is in a sense a path uh, you know a step towards secularization in the broader also scientific naturalistic approach and so on so mm, probably there is also no uh, with humanism the revival of pagan classical models I mean that definitely does bring also in the four new new conceptions of history you know what the, the civilizations that had declined in the past the, you know the idea of that the glory of the world is uh, is strange and transient and that the, the 13th century had maybe not contributed so much with the, the, the rise of the Capetian monarchy of this the the acme of the feudal elite much to to uh, to reinvigorate as a concept because it was the triumph of that earthly model that it was already humanistic in its own regard I mean as we've seen it stand from 12th century renaissance and it brought to unmanned the you know the confidence the capacity the idea you can go out there in the world and do something right uh, look at the Bamberga uh, Ritter right and that's that's a powerful image of a man that is confident of the world he lives in this inward looking of 14th century art that is not just as we've seen the religious one is instead um, a bit the refusal maybe the disenchantment towards the possibility of the creation of a, of a universal synthesis and the more if you want even more pragmatic by the, the current needs um, necessity to look at the the present day reality something that happened to you personally right even considering that uh, life one is was in that sense less bright, right? And therefore you wonder, you know, what 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 next? Because uh, more than seeking glory out there in the world, but naturally it's a complex topic as you understand, and you have to observe it also from other points, standpoints, politically, philosophically. Mm. All right. Well, for now we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.